If you want to quit your job, build wealth, and attain more freedom in your life, the fastest way to accomplish that goal is to buy an existing profitable business. Forget startups, they're way too risky and the vast majority of them fail. Side hustles aren't likely to get you there, especially if you're a midlife entrepreneur with kids and a family because they just, where are you going to find all that extra time to compete with the people that don't have those things that are willing to work around the clock. So unless you like working 60 hour weeks and making very little money, side hustles are not the way to go. Startups are too risky. So the solution is buying an existing business. And in this video, I'm going to teach you everything that I know to get you started on the path to buy an existing profitable business. Ready to go? Let's get started. So the very first thing I want to do is I want to dispel two very common myths from people who've never bought a business before. Myth number one is I can't afford it. The answer is if you're a midlife person and you own your own home, yes, you can. And at the end of this video, I'm going to teach you exactly where you're going to get the money. And number two is while there's no good businesses for sale, well, the reality is that's just not true. Great businesses get sold all the time for a wide variety of reasons. And here's a few of them. I'm retiring. I'm sick. I'm getting a divorce. I've gone to jail. There's any number of reasons why really great businesses can become available for you to buy. Them. So now let's talk about what type of businesses you could or should buy. At the highest level, you have kind of two categories. Category number one is a franchise. Category number two is a non-franchise. And obviously there's a lot of subcategories in both of those, but let's address that first. You should buy a franchise if you are someone who's maybe never operated a business before or never been in a leadership position in corporate America before, or you're the type of person who really wants to follow a very specific formula or there's a particular franchise that you're just really, really interested in because you want to own multiple locations. The great thing about franchises is the rate of failure is much likely or is far likely to be less. There are plenty of them for sale and they do scale reasonably well. The downside of a franchise, of course, is you've got to pay those franchise fees or ever and you're giving up your autonomy to do with your business whatever it is that you want to do in my case i'm an experienced entrepreneur i have yet to ever purchase a franchise simply because i feel like i'm more than capable of figuring out the nuances of that business all on my own i don't want to pay the franchise fee up front i don't want to pay the royalty on an ongoing basis and i've just never found a franchise that captured my interest enough to want to go down the road. All right, so now that we've talked about franchise versus non-franchise, let's talk about two other really important factors for you to consider. The first one is passion business versus boring business. So a passion business is, I really like beer, so I'm gonna start a business to do with beer. Or I like, I really like video games, so I'm gonna start a business that has something to do with video games. Passion businesses, can be great, but there are definitely some drawbacks. For example, what if you don't have any passions that are aligned with the right type of business opportunity or the market size or the market potential is not sufficient enough? What that's going to mean is you're going to have a tiny little passion business that really doesn't make very much money. And I can tell you with a fair degree of certainty, you're going to lose your passion for that passionate business pretty darn quickly. In my case, I'm not so much concerned with being passionate about what the business sells. It's important, but it's not the number one factor for me. Instead, I'm more concerned about the, the opportunity for that business to grow and withstand economic adversity. So in other words, I kind of like boring, predictable businesses, and I, I have plenty of passions outside of business, and I'm also passionate about growing the business, but I'm mostly interested in creating certainty of my cash flow. So for example, one of my companies, uh, well, there's two businesses that I own currently. 
One of them is a software company where the customers are paying on a monthly or annual subscription. So of course that has a high level of certainty for cash flow. The other one is a waste management business where our customers use us over and over and over again. And as you might imagine, whether the economy is booming or whether the economy is kind of soft, waste is still being produced on an ongoing basis. Therefore, we are what I would call a non-discretionary spend. In other words, our customers are gonna keep sending us their money. We're gonna keep delivering services really kind of regardless of how the economy is going. So I can't make this decision for you other than to point this out and to get you thinking about which way would be better for you to go. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I think boring businesses are the better way to go. Now, the second factor to think about is how big of a company do you want to buy? And as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to explain at the end of this video how you can tap into far more capital than you probably think you can. So you might have the opportunity to buy a business that has 10 or 15 or 20 employees or maybe more, depending upon your current level of wealth. Here's the idea that I want to implant in your head. If you buy a really small business where you're the, the only person running the show, it's not really a business. It's more self-employment because chances are, there are of course exceptions to this rule, but chances are if you're not working, the business is not making it money, which is not a good business. On the other hand, if you buy a business that's large enough that it has at least a small team in place, things are still going to get done every single day, whether you're the one doing them or not. In my case, I have a preference for larger businesses, ideally where there are general managers in place who are managing the people who are doing all the stuff that needs to be done every single day so that I can instead spend my time more working on the business as opposed to working in it. All right, next I wanted to share with you the three ways where you can start finding these businesses that will be available for you to purchase. The very first one, we're gonna hop over onto the computer here and I'm gonna show you which website I like to use to find businesses to take a look at. All right, so there's three main places where you can find businesses to buy. You can find them on websites, you can find them through business brokers, or you can do local networking in your town. So the very first thing that I want to do is show you my preferred method for using websites. So there's a business that I'm in due diligence on right now. It is uh, a mobile truck washing service. They wash about 4,000 trucks a month. And I actually found that business right here on Biz Buy Sell. So in Biz Buy Sell, you can enter the name of your town. So let's say that, you know, you're from San Francisco or wherever you're from. Here we go. And in the beginning, when you're starting your search, don't worry about choosing in industries or anything like that, unless you want to. But in the beginning, you might want to keep your filters fairly simple. So for example, I want to have, you know, gross revenue maximum of $3 million because, you know, you, you for whatever reason, that's what fits for you. And you want it to be doing, oh, I'll say at least 500,000 or again, whatever amount of revenue feels right to you. And then you'll get this list of businesses across all sorts of industries and categories and simply scrolling and browsing and looking at these deals is going to help you to become clearer on the type of business that you might like to have. And it might surprise you some of the opportunities that you find. And then as you find one that you like, you, of course, you can just click into it and you can get more information. You can, a lot of times this information will be filled out. I tend to prefer to see more transparency than less. And then you can put in your contact information there and the broker will get in touch with you for you to learn more about the business. All right, so the next way number two to find profitable businesses to buy is to work with business brokers. Now, North America is filled with business brokers and I would imagine the rest of the world is the same. And these are kind of like real estate agents. Some of them are really professional and really great. Others, not so much maybe more like a car salesperson. Your job is to find and network and build relationships with the business brokers who are the, the professionals who've been doing it a long time and who bring the best opportunities to market. Now, my advice to you is to do whatever you can to build a relationship and establish credibility with that business broker 
so that ideally when they get a new listing or even before the business is listed, they're calling you saying, hey, I've got this great opportunity. And one of the very best ways to do that is to make sure that number one, you know what it is that you want to buy. If you call a business broker and say, oh, well, I'll just buy anything, they're not going to pay any attention to you. So spend time on biz buy sell, look at enough deals so that you know what kind of company you wanna buy. Number two, know the size of the company that you wanna buy and make sure that you can finance that business and that you have shown them via proof of funds that you are serious and actually have the capital to get the deal closed. And then finally, number three or the third method of finding businesses that are for sale is to just look at off market businesses. In other words, they're not even for sale yet. No matter where you live, there are going to be businesses that are owned by somebody who's thinking about retiring, wants to retire, is sick, is going through a divorce. For whatever reason, if you come along and you say to them, hey, look, I'm really interested in buying your business. Let's have a conversation about that. Some of them are going to say yes. And in those situations, you're going to have the advantage in that you'll probably be the only buyer for that business. Hey, are you digging this video? If you are, please do me the solid and smash that like button right now to tell the YouTube algorithm that more people should get the opportunity to see this video because my channel is not yet that popular. I need to be honest, I need all the help I can get. And if you're liking this video and you'd like to see other videos from me in the future, go ahead and subscribe to the channel click the little bell. And if you have questions, of course, leave those in the comments right down below. Thank you. Sir. So now that we've talked about the different types of businesses that you could decide to acquire, I want to help you to better understand a couple of really other important criteria. Criteria number one is whenever I'm looking at a business to get into or to purchase, I ask myself this, what's my advantage going to be? For example, the very last thing I want to enter a business where there's just a sea of competition and I'm just a me too. A perfect example of this is a generic marketing agency or an Amazon reseller. There's absolutely nothing unique about you. You have no advantage whatsoever and you're going to have a very tough road to hope. So two areas where I look. So let me back up. In the case of local businesses, which I really like, and it's where I'm putting my money these days. One of my advantages, of course, is limited competition. There's only so many other providers in town and if all of my customers are in town, that's a smaller pool for them to choose from. And so my advantage is not as much competition. My advantage may also be uh, better local marketing or more personal relationships or something that you can quantify. Now, speaking of marketing, the next thing that I'm going to look at any time that I'm looking, getting into or buying a business is how am I going to drive revenue? Is the existing owner doing a good job of marketing? Or maybe, you know, they've been at it for a while and they're just kind of coasting into retirement and they're not doing anything particularly spectacular. And for you to improve some as aspect of the business and drive more revenue is going to be relatively easy. I'll give you an example of this. A guy that I know recently, well, recently, about a year ago, purchased a metal fabrication shop here in my town. The seller that he bought it from was a grumpy old man. And so grumpy old man's customer service wasn't very good. He simply made improvements to customer service and was able to double the revenue within 12 months. Pretty spectacular and obviously very positive in his cash flow. So before you go into any business, I really want you to think about how am I going to improve the marketing or sales versus the owner before me? And the final thing that I want to think that I want you to think about, because it's something I always think about is how can I cut my costs? Now, most older traditional business owners, it never occurred to them to hire employees that were remote and unless you've been hiding under a rock for the last few years, there's been a significant trend to hiring, uh, especially computer worker employees that are in another country. In our case, we've been hiring people in the Philippines for the last 10 years. It has been very, very good for us because one, they're every bit as skilled as your as a comparable American or North American worker. And two, they cost 
only about 25 to 30 percent of your fully burdened payroll of your North American worker, which all which means all of that savings is going to go right to the bottom line and into your bank account. That's a very, very good thing. So make sure that you think carefully about those three criteria before entering into or buying this. All right, now let's talk a little bit about expectations of how long this is going to take. Trying to find just the right business to buy is going to, as a matter of fact, if you're just embarking on this journey for the first time, I would encourage you to expect it to take somewhere between three to six months. Your first three months, you're just gonna be looking at a lot of deals. You're gonna be getting better at asking questions. You're gonna be signing a lot of it. You're gonna be reviewing financials and reviewing the business memorandums, which is basically just the description of the business and all its and so forth. And that is going to be very, very, very educational for you. And you're gonna get a lot smarter with every deal that you look at. And then as your confidence builds, you might actually get to the point around the two, three month area where you start actually making offers and entering into negotiations. And so all of that just takes time. Now, I really want to make sure that don't get impatient during this process because there's this little thing called opportunity cost that you don't forget about. For example, you are in a hurry and you're just trying to get a business bought, you may end up buying what's not a very good business. And now you're stuck with that for probably a few years. And maybe if you just waited two more months, you might have found something that was significantly better because with the first deal, you didn't look at enough deals to know if that was a really good one or not. And so you really just don't want to put yourself in that position where you rushed, you bought the wrong business, and now you're in place. That you don't want to All right, before we finish up this video, we're going to talk about two more things. Thing number one is how to negotiate price and then, of course, the thing that I talked to you about earlier is how the heck finance so if you don't have any cash on hand to write a check for books. All right, now let's talk about price. Now, there's going to be two scenarios that you're going to have to deal with. If you're going after an off-market deal, there isn't likely to be an asking price. And in that situation, if you go about negotiations wrong, you can really put yourself in a position where you're not going to win. So here's what you should not do for an off-market deal. You go, you meet with the seller, and they are like, yeah, sure, you know, I'll sell my business, uh, make me an offer. Yeah, that's first of all, not a serious seller. And second of all, more than likely, what's gonna happen is when you present them your first offer, they're gonna go, no, not enough. Then you're gonna go back to your calculator and your spreadsheet, and you're gonna come up with a higher price. Then you're gonna come back and present a higher price. And they're gonna be like, no, that's not enough. Well, what are you teaching them? You're teaching them that they can make more money just by saying no. And that's going to escalate and escalate to the point where either you don't do a deal or you overpay for that business. A better approach is to follow the advice here that I'm about to give. And that is, and this applies to both off-market deals and on-market deals, find out why they're selling. What, what is the problem that they're trying to solve? So the problem is if that, let's say that, well, I'm retiring. Well, the problem might be, of course, that they're just burned out or they're tired of working or they want to move somewhere else or they want to buy a boat or they want to live in an RV. You need to build enough of a relationship with the seller that you can ask these questions so that your offer, which is comprised of not just the price, also terms can be structured in such a way as to be highly beneficial for both parties. For example, let's say a seller is retiring and they're simply looking to maximize their income after the sale. Well, if they sell for a traditional cash deal, they're going to have a huge tax bill, problem number one. And problem number two is if they haven't been an active investor for their whole lives in addition to owning the business, what are they going to do with the money to be able to earn them a sufficient amount of income to live off of for however many years of retirement they have ahead of them. Perhaps in that situation, a much better offer that you could make them would be, hey, I'm going to give you 10% down or 20% down, and I want you to carry the rest for 
a term of say eight years and I'll pay you 6% interest and then there'll be a balloon payment at the end or whatever it is, but that allows the seller to amortize their capital gains over the duration, the term of that note that they're carrying. And it also allows you to get into a business possibly without even getting any bank financing. So be very crafty and very careful when you're making your offers and consider the problems the seller's trying to solve, the price you're gonna offer and the terms that you're going to yeah. All right, we've covered a lot in this video and earlier on, I promised that I would explain to you where you're gonna get the money from. So the number one thing I think people are concerned about when they're looking at financing a business is the amount of debt that they may have to take on and if you're in the United States, you have access to this amazing thing called an SBA loan, which is a Small Business Administration loan. Now in another video, and I'm gonna link in the description to this video, to the specific timestamp in another video where I give all of the details of why an SBA loan is such a fantastic tool for financing the acquisition of a business, and how it is much, much, much less risk. I was actually blown away when I talked to Live Oak Bank and he explained to me how all of the ways that the SBA will work with you should your business that you required run into difficulty and you ever find yourself in a situation where making payments might be a challenge. The good news is the very last thing that they want to do is put that loan into default. So they're going to be very, very flexible with you. So again, check out the link in the description. It'll link you to the specific timestamp in another video where I go into more detail on this. And finally, I want to thank you very much for hanging out with me to the very end. If you've enjoyed this video and you haven't already clicked that like button, I'd love it if you do that. This channel is young and it needs all the help that it can get to become more popular. If you'd like to see future videos, Make sure you subscribe and click that little bell. And finally, I'm pretty sure that there's stuff that I have not included in this video simply because it never occurred to me. And you probably have questions and I'd love to hear what your questions are. So please leave those down in the comments below. I'll either answer you or I, if I get enough questions about the same type of thing, I might then make subsequent videos and dive deeper down into those rabbit holes. It's been my privilege to make this video for you. I hope it's been helpful. I hope you use this information to make a significant improvement, change, whatever you want to call it, in your life. I will see you in the next video. And by the way, if you've enjoyed this video, you're probably going to enjoy this one right here every bit as much. Take care.